This video is sponsored by Siemens. Thanks, Siemens. When people think of cities, they picture glittering skylines, busy streets, beautiful parks, and underfunded mass transit. While these are all city things, none of it would be possible without the infrastructure under it all, particularly the wastewater system. Sewers, basically. For every bustling downtown, there's one or more of these, wastewater treatment plants. Without them, cities would be smaller, smellier, and sicker. This video is an appreciation of the wastewater system. I mean, how often do we even think about wastewater? We just assume that the water going down there, or there, or there, will just be taken care of. In this video, we'll get into topics like stormwater, bioswales, water treatment, and fatbergs. It won't all be gross, though. We'll also talk about the massive infrastructure projects going on underneath our cities and the infrastructure making our sewers more sustainable. Let's start with the basics. Cities have lots of water that people don't want to be there. There are two major sources of that water. The first is stormwater, typically rainwater falling on streets, roofs, parking lots, as well as the pervious surfaces like lawns and forests. The second is wastewater. This is the water that goes down the drain in kitchens and bathrooms all over a city. Let's start by talking about how stormwater is dealt with. How does all this wastewater get swept away from a city? There are several types of sewage systems, but let's look at the most common for urban areas. First, we have combined sewers. This is a common system in cities. It's basically a big old pipe running a couple meters below city streets. All of the wastewater, both wastewater from buildings and stormwater from runoff, gets collected into the same pipe. The manhole covers you see on city streets lead to these pipes. They're big, expensive systems that only make economic sense in urban areas. Combined sewers have been around for a long time. Rome's Cloaca Maxima is a great example. Originally built as an open sewer sometime around the 6th century BC, it was gradually expanded and covered over time. Eventually, wastewater from aqueduct use flowed into the facility, making it a true combined sewer. The Cloaca Maxima is technically still in continuous use, as a small amount of water is still transferred through it to the outfall near the Ponte Roto Bridge over the Tiber River. The name combined system provides a clue about the next system, a separate system. This is where wastewater from buildings gets its own pipes, called sanitary sewers, and runoff gets another set of pipes, called stormwater sewers. The sanitary sewer pipes travel to a wastewater treatment plant, while the stormwater flows back into the river. There are other systems out there, but combined and separate systems are the most common in cities. You won't find many open sewers these days, for example, because they're major sources of disease. These systems each have their own pros and cons, and some of the big ones are related to what happens after the wastewater is collected. In a combined system, all of the stormwater and wastewater reaches a treatment facility. Here, the wastewater is typically removed of solids. Then the facility removes suspended organic material, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Sometimes the remaining liquid is disinfected to kill bacteria. Then that liquid, far cleaner now than when it entered, is discharged into waterways. This works great normally, but during heavy rain events, there can be too much wastewater for the treatment facility to handle. What happens to the excess? Typically, all of that raw sewage gets dumped into a nearby river. These are called combined sewer overflow events, and they are not great for the environment, obviously. Separate systems don't really have this problem. All of the sanitary sewer material goes to the treatment facility, while the stormwater is collected and dumped directly into a body of water, bypassing any treatment. You don't get the black water, with the industry term for toilet waste, into the river, but stormwater isn't exactly clean either. It picks up oil and grease from cars, cigarette butts, litter, and whatever else is on the street. It's why you'll sometimes see flows to river painted near storm drains. It's to encourage you not to pour anything down that you wouldn't want to be swimming in later. The system with the longest history is the combined sewer, and big cities like New York, Paris, and London still use them today. Most systems installed after about 1950 use a separate approach. Neither of these systems have sterling environmental records. What can be done to make them better for our rivers and lakes? One of the most important things we can all do is not put things down drains that don't belong there. That means don't wash grease down the sink drain. Instead, drain grease into a can or jar and then throw it away after it hardens. In the bathroom, don't flush wet wipes, tampons, condoms, or diapers. They don't break down and create clogs. Some of the most infamous clogs in sewer history is a combination of all this stuff. I'm talking about the fatbergs of London. Fatbergs are giant masses of fat that form into a blockage when combined with diapers, wipes, and other debris. They're also an interesting chemical reaction taking place, too. Wastewater often contains a lot of calcium, which it picks up when it runs over concrete streets and sidewalks and through concrete pipes. When that calcium water mixes with grease and fat, it transforms the fat into a dense mass 
thanks to saponification. This is the same chemical process that creates soap. The largest fatberg found in the London system was 140 tons and took workers weeks to remove. London launched a campaign to encourage people to put fat and wipes into the garbage cans instead. London's not the only city battling fatbergs. Tokyo had a fatberg washout to sea in 2000 and since then have been educating their citizens as well. London's not just relying on education, they're also building a new super sewer to increase capacity and supplement the Victorian era sewers that they rely on now. Those old sewers were a feat of engineering at the time, with 1,100 miles constructed out of 300 million bricks. The designers had the foresight to build the sewer for 4 million people, back when London only had 2 million inhabitants. Today, London's population is approaching 9 million, so you can see where the problem is. The pipes aren't large enough to flush out those fatbergs. Like a lot of cities, London also experiences many combined sewer overflow events that pollute their river. The new sewers will divert this overflow deep underground and send it to another treatment facility. London isn't the only city investing in massive combined sewer upgrades. Washington, D.C. is spending $2.6 billion to build an additional 18 miles of tunnel to reduce their combined sewer overflows by 96% in the region. It's the largest infrastructure project in the area since the Washington metro system opened in the 1970s. Two tunnels have already opened and the remaining tunnels will be open early in the next decade. Portland, Oregon completed its big pipe project in 2011 and reduced its outflows into the Willamette River by 94%. Seriously, if you Google CSO projects, you'll find links to all kinds of city websites that describe their sewer projects to stop dumping raw sewage into their rivers. Building big, expensive pipes, often called great infrastructure, is one way to solve environmental problems around sewers, especially the combined sewers that can trigger outflows. But in separate sewers, water from the street and parking lot goes directly into nearby waterways without any treatment at all. Recently, green infrastructure has been deployed in cities to improve the quality of stormwater before it enters the sewer system. One piece of green infrastructure that you've probably noticed in cities already is the bioswale. These facilities are essentially rain gardens placed in long, narrow spaces between the sidewalk and the curb. They take water from the street, store it, and treat it before the excess water flows into the sewer drain at the far end much of the water that would have ended up in the sewer just gets absorbed into the ground. Bioswales are planted with vegetation that could absorb excess nutrients like phosphates and nitrates. These compounds often cause eutrophication, or algae blooms, when they are dumped from the sewers directly into a waterway, so it's much better to filter them out in a bioswale. You'll also see cities with combined sewers building bioswales, retention ponds, green roofs, rain gardens, and permeable pavement to reduce the spike in wastewater that occurs when storms bring rain. These green facilities hold water and slowly release them into the sewer system, reducing the spike right after the storm and evening out flows. When thinking about wastewater and sustainability, it makes sense to think about water, but also electricity. About 3-4% to of U.S. energy consumption is used to move water around. Electricity is needed to power pumps and water treatment facilities. Reducing electricity use for wastewater facilities can also reduce carbon emissions and make the whole moving water around thing much more sustainable. Municipalities will often conduct an energy audit of a water system and find places where energy can be saved. Sometimes, efficiencies can be found by repairing pipe leaks or improving systems to make existing machinery run more efficiently. Often, municipalities looking to improve efficiency and sustainability will opt to replace aging equipment with newer, more energy-efficient models. For example, Siemens, the sponsor of this video, recently worked with a municipality to replace a pumping station run by a steam boiler-driven system installed in 1901. Not only were these things near the end of their useful life, they were inefficient and not sustainable. Siemens switched the pumping station from boilers to modern electric pumps that will save the city over $4 million a year in operating costs. More importantly, the modern equipment is better for the environment. So there you have it. Sewer systems, the engineering marvels that made modern cities possible over 100 years ago, are becoming more efficient and sustainable in the 21st century. Old sewer pipes and boiler-driven pumps are being replaced by new sewer mega-projects, bioswales, and better electrical infrastructure. It's good to know that cities are making these improvements to keep the clean water flowing from our taps and keep our toilets flushing.